Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at two vintage telescopes from the 1960s or thereabouts. One fairly common and the other quite rare. Let's take a look. So the first and more common as you might guess because I have two of them here is this AC Gilbert reflector, two and a half inch or so F10 Newtonian on a ball head mount. Now the AC Gilbert company was founded in the early part of the 20th century by Alfred C. Gilbert in New Haven, Connecticut. He was of all things a magician, but the company grew to the point where it was once at nearly 5,000 employees, the largest employer in New Haven, Connecticut. That's where you find Yale University today. The company thrived on science-oriented toys, and its claim to fame is that it introduced the Erector set to the world, a toy that lives on even today, although the company filed bankruptcy in 1967. If you're interested in Gilbert himself, there was a 2002 film called The Man Who Saved Christmas, starring Jason Alexander as Mr. Gilbert himself. Perhaps the most famous or infamous of the A.C. Gilbert toys was this atomic energy kit for kids featuring real live radioactive samples. It did come with a warning label not to remove the uranium from those glass bottles, not for health reasons, but because it could raise the background radiation, thus ruining whatever experiment the kit wanted you to do at the time. I'm curious, did anybody out there have one of these as a kid, and if so, did you play with it? And here we are with two Gilbert telescopes. It looks like I have one. This is not a case that fits inside the other one. This is actually two separate models. There are a couple of different versions of these. This one actually came in a cardboard case. You can see the carrying handle up here. But uh, you know, you open this up and you'll see the Gilbert inside. This one here is a zippered case and this one, you can see the bright, clear labeling inside. This is considered very desirable. This was well taken care of. It was not left out in the sun, but the optical tube is like this. Here is the focuser. The eyepiece is rather, rather strange. It, it looks like a normal 0.965 inch eyepiece, but this part just comes right off here. And there's another field lens and there's nothing holding that in. It's just a lens and this thing doesn't actually snap in there all that hard. It, this thing has come off a couple of times and I've lost that field lens a number of times already. So if you do buy one of these, this is one of the first parts that goes missing. Be sure you get that. I'll put that back in here. This is a sight tube. It functions as your finder. Here's your tube ring. And what you do here is this is the ball head that it sort of rides on. And this is reminiscent of the uh, bowling ball mounts that you see used by ATMs. So you would just swivel on that. I'm going to take this off for a second, like this. Set this aside. And the legs here, this is actually quite well done here. There's a slotted plate here, and the legs just go in here. There's no tools required. You just put the legs on here, and this is a solar funnel that you put over here. Look at this, it's already fallen out. I'll put that together a little bit later. But um, yeah, I mean, the literature that comes with this is pretty good. This uh, manual, actually quite nice. Um, if this is the original manual, it is copyright 1960. And there's a generous planetary guide here giving you the planet's position all the way out to 1962. Very nice. So this one here, it's very similar. It's an 80 power telescope. And I have heard that there are some that were 40 power. Um, I think that'd probably be a, a little bit nicer, but here's a reproduced star map from H.A. Ray's The Stars. And this one, in case this is the original manual, is copyright 1963. So this is a later one. And you can tell by the planetary positions here. It lists the positions all the way out to 1966. Again, there are some differences here. So here's the tripod head for the 1960 version. Here's the one for the 1963. You can see the mounting is a little bit different. And these legs are a lot smaller and thinner. Don't have quite that wingnut arrangement here. I prefer the earlier version 
myself. And here we are with the Gilbert outside looking at the sun. By the way, the way you find the sun is you look at the shadow on the ground and make it as small as possible. Don't look at the sun itself. Here it is on the projection screen here. And of course, we're doing what every telescope manufacturer has told you never to do from the beginning of time. Don't look at the sun with an unfiltered telescope. But I'm guessing any company that sells you a toy kit with radioactive materials is not going to be terribly concerned about that. Okay, so how do these things perform as telescopes? Well, you know, these things are marketed as toys for kids. They might be a little bit better than that. I found that I could actually go observing with them. I looked at the moon. It had a little bit of false color, that purple fringing at the limb, due to the inexpensive eyepiece here. I was able to find objects like M13 and M3. Those are big globular clusters that are up at this time of the year. I did find, however, this ball head was inconsistent. I found when I had to tilt it up like this towards the zenith, it tended to get a little bit unstable and I couldn't hold it. So I was stuck looking at things on the horizon. Again, the short tripod made this a little bit difficult as well. I tried setting it on something, it wasn't quite stable, so I put it on the ground, and then I was kneeling on the ground. I know you might be able to do some basic observing with this, but I don't know if this is a long-term observing instrument. So if you're looking to buy one of these things, I don't know if I would pay too much. These things are fairly common. If you don't find one in the condition that you want at the price that you like, sit tight, another one will come along later. Make sure you get all of the parts, especially that lens that goes inside the eyepiece here, that part often goes missing. Again, don't pay too much. I've had club members tell me they buy these routinely at less than $15 and even less than $10 sometimes. So check your local thrift stores, estate sales, and flea markets. Craigslist is also a good option. So the second model is this Monolux number 4390 Newtonian reflector, four and a half inch F8 on an alt as wooden tripod. So most telescopes you see from Monolux are going to be small refractors. In fact, before I saw this one, I didn't even know that Monolux had Newtonian reflectors. In fact, an internet search turns up one thread on the Cloudy Nights forum from somebody else who has one of these, and I find no mention of this model anywhere else. This sample came from the attic of a club member's father-in-law who passed away. As you can see from the box, it's bright red. It has been very well preserved. Obviously, this thing has never seen sunlight. And opening the box, the parts appear to be in excellent condition. Dating these things is always tricky. The Cloudy Nights thread suggests that because of the presence of this, this is the black plastic dust cap, that it dates from 1964 or later. There is at least one other club member who concurs. So I'm really curious how this thing performs. So let's Get it up on a mount and take a look. And here we are with the Monolux number 4390, four and a half inch F8 Newtonian reflector on an Altaz mount. And you know, looking at this thing casually, it could pass for a modern version. Not a lot has changed in 50 or 60 years since this thing came out. You've got an optical tube, a tube ring, a way to couple it to the mount. You have a four and a half inch primary in a mirror cell that looks surprisingly like the ones you have today with six-point collimation. You have a secondary mirror, three-stock secondary with collimation on its own. The mirrors on this thing, I have to say, are in really good condition, and it's collimated. I didn't have to align much of the optics at all. There isn't much dust on it. Uh, the wood is in great condition. If I had to guess, this thing wasn't used very much. So how does this differ from a modern telescope? Well, you've got a 5x24 finder, this Altaz mount moves on this center bolt here and on an azimuth bearing that isn't all that smooth. And the focuser is, has a 20 millimeter Huygenian eyepiece, 0.965 inches in a helical plastic focuser. So if you know your telescopes, there are at least three words in that previous sentence that might cause you some concern. Huygenian, 0.965, and helical. And yes, it's not that great. You turn the focuser this way. It's a weird sort of locking collar here. And I think the main issue is that a Huygenian eyepiece has such a narrow field of view. 
further constricted by the .965 format, it doesn't show you very much sky, so your aiming does have to be very good. So of more concern here are the other two objects I mentioned, the finder. So it's listed as a 5x24 finder, but if you look down the lens, it is stopped down quite a bit. I mean, look at that. I don't think that thing gathers much more than the human eye does. I ran some quick experiments with this finder and then I put it away. I installed a red dot finder, my Rigel quick finder on top of this thing using one of the mounting holes and things got a lot better. But the main problem with this one is this azimuth and altitude bolt here. There's something wrong. There's 50 year old grease in there that's binding and this screw seems to be locked in here somehow. I've had a couple of guys look at this. We can't seem to extract it. It seems to be captive and locked in there somehow. Something is not right. It's binding. The bolt turns when it shouldn't, and when you think the bolt should turn, it freezes. So at some areas of the sky, you can't reach them because of the way it is. We're going to take this nice and slow because you don't want to break something trying to extract that bolt. Now, if you wanted to, you could take the tube ring off. There's, you'll see a diamond-shaped pattern here with two threaded bolts on the bottom. You see this a lot from vintage Japanese refractors and reflectors of this time. And you can actually install your own plate, like a Vixen plate, and put it on a mount for yourself. You can do that if you want. I just left this thing the way it was and tried to use it as is. I found M13, I found M92, both of those in Hercules, I found M3, I split Mizar and Alcor. Not bad, I think the optics on this are pretty good. If you wanted to take the next step, you could replace this focuser with an inch and a quarter, uh, with a rack and pinion or a Crayford style focuser. I don't think I'm going to go that far yet because there is some value in leaving this thing as original. A collector might want to see it in original condition. So, there you have it. A look at a couple of vintage telescopes. If you do get interested in these things, people have suggested that neither of these models, despite the rarity of this one, are terribly valuable at this point. I don't know if I'd buy them as an investment. Get them because it's a piece of our history and to capture some nostalgia. I will give you this warning. Viewing and collecting vintage telescopes can be an addictive sub-hobby to our main hobby itself. You may find yourself haunting flea markets, thrift stores, Craigslist, and estate sales. If so, I wish you luck. Let us know how you're doing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.